In nearly all cases with modern health systems, you're waiting months for appointments only to spend a mere 10 minutes with a doctor who quickly hands out a generic diagnosis that is likely rooted in a total misunderstanding of health and causes, and then you're offered a one-size-fits-all medication or invasive treatments with unpleasant side effects. If this sounds all too familiar, consider a different approach with the New Biology Clinic founded by Dr. Tom Cowan, a respected natural health doctor, author, and speaker. Dr. Cowan's holistic perspective on health and wellness and a deep understanding of the true nature of health and disease sets this clinic apart. With the New Biology Clinic, it's not about quick fixes and suppressing symptoms. The practitioners take time to understand your unique story recognizing that health is unique to the individual and that illnesses have a variety of causes physically and metaphysically. Members of the New Biology Clinic enjoy a flat monthly fee that includes a range of valuable services like health consults as needed, practitioner-led live streams on diverse health topics, access to a members-only resource library, and multiple live group sessions every month. These sessions cover fitness, breathing integration, biofield tuning, guided meditation, EFT tapping, and much more. Unlike traditional healthcare systems that thrive on frequent visits, prescriptions, treatments, and suppressing symptoms, the New Biology Clinic's motivation is to make you healthy and keep you that way. Visit newbiologyclinic.com to learn more and use code THEWAYFORWARD for $50 off your account activation. If you're a member of The Way Forward, email hello at thewayforward.com to receive $150 off your account activation. Your journey to genuine healing begins here. Mickey Clan has a diverse background and a passion for making a positive impact on the world. Her passion for making a difference led her to become a prominent figure in the freedom movement where she aims to empower individuals to stand up against tyranny. In recent years, Mickey has used her knowledge of surety bonds and common law to help parents fight against mask mandates in schools. Her efforts have led to the liberation of over 100 million children worldwide, and this has inspired others to follow her lead in their communities. Mickey's story is one of determination, innovation, and a desire to make the world a better place. She continues to inspire others through her work and her unwavering belief in the power of the individual to create change. For more on Mickey, please head to the various links in the show notes. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Mickey's work, you may be aware of the fact that she is a big Trump supporter. And if you've listened to this podcast for a while or you follow me on social media, you know that I am absolutely not a Trump supporter at all. But as you'll see during this episode, We can find common goals that move us towards collective freedom, irrespective of our philosophical differences. And I got to give credit to Mickey. She is very knowledgeable on all things related to common law and offers a lot of common law-esque solutions. Um, And that's the majority of the focus of this episode is those common law solutions. And as I've shared before on this sort of bridging the gap between the self-governance voluntarist future that all of us want uh, using these, these common law approaches. So that's what we focus on during this episode. And it was an awesome conversation. So um, again, some, some philosophical differences, but that is totally okay because there's still some things that we can do to come together to push the envelope towards more freedom. Enjoy. Mickey, so um, yeah, this this topic is uh, is becoming an increasingly hot topic. I'll say that, and it's also, in my opinion, a very important topic, especially like from a broader lens. You could say, looking at the uh, de facto corporate entity that is the United States and the de jure United States of America, which was representing independent nation states. And we've covered this briefly on the show, but um, you take all of that information and you've actually found a way to apply it to hold men and women accountable who are representing that de facto corporate entity, right? Yes. 
Yes, I think it's really important as we all start to learn common law that everyone is accountable for their own actions in common law. There's no hiding behind a corporate veil. Um, if you if you get a job at McDonald's and they ask you to murder someone, it's you know who do you think is is liable? You know, and I think the liability aspect of what they've done to our country has really confused people, as in they think that if in in a sense they're God is their employer and that their God can tell them to fall, you know, to force inoculate, <clears throat> you know, their, their staff or that they can just force children to wear masks for, mm -hmm. you know, two and a half years or two years in school. You know, this is not acceptable. Um, people have to realize they have personal liability for mm -hmm. their actions, no matter who they work for. And you're talking about personal liability for each of these men and women who are acting in what they think is their capacity with whatever title they have before their name or after their name representing their position in government. And this is now sort of saying, I don't care what your title is. You as a man or a woman are responsible for your own actions. 100%. And there's something very spiritual about that. And I don't think people realize how spiritual of a war this really is. You know, I mean, um, and I don't mean religious, I mean, spiritual, right. right? Because to, it might not be spiritual to us, the law system, but it is extremely spiritual to our enemy. I've come to understand that it is quite spiritual. I mean, if you read, for example, Genesis four, that's talking about trusts and that's talking about essentially revoking and re revesting title and reclaiming your securities. So it's uh, exactly. It's it very is very spiritual. much a common law dictionary, right. <laughs> as well as a trust Bible. It's a trust. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's a reason that they place these black, you know, robes on these folks and they summon and sentence us, you know, and they lay claim over and they, um, you know, because no one else claimed you. Right. Right. And they do that overlay all the time. They do it over the person or the body. And you can't, I mean, so I kind of look at it like a crate. You have the crate that they place you in when you're born. And it's almost like that's what they trade you in. That's that bond or the trust. And then they place the body inside. So your living being is inside that crate. And then they place an overlay, which is the corporation title. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then it's like, it's like sticking a sticker on your chest and saying from this day forth, the sticker is you and not you it's the title. Right. And this is the all caps version. And this is the real world woman. And, so, so what happens is you end up and they, they do that everywhere, by the way, I want to just throw that out. They do that over land. They do overlays over land to claim it. They don't actually own the land, but they own the deed or the title or the right. overlay. Uh, they don't own the corporate government. You know, they own the corporate government, but they don't, don't own the Republic. So the corporate government is an overlay over the Republic. And then it's the same thing with the whole entire land grab at the Vatican, you know? So, I mean, the Vatican and the Pope declared that they owned, you know, pretty much anything that wasn't white, white supremacist. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and it's like, you watch this happen throughout time. You start to see their tactics replayed and played out from every country. It's not just the U S you right. know? Right. Yeah. So interesting anecdote. Um, someone whom I work with is, uh, has was seeing some clients that were dealing with a, a marriage in China, I believe. And they're trying to figure out how to approach the situation. And it turns out that this Chinese marriage certificate also had a QCIP and was also traded as commercial paper routing back to the UK. So this idea of a new world order being a thing that is coming, the reality is it's, it's already been in place and everything is British commercial paper. Everything. We are living in a slave planet. And what's just absolutely staggering to me is they did it legally. Mm -hmm. they, they're not lawful, but they did it legally. Like, right. And it was all based on assumptions, presumptions, and piracy, like the pirate syntax. So when people start to realize that they're speaking a different language, that they have a different understanding of who they are in the matter and who you are in the matter. And they have a very, very um, intentional way of manipulating you into keeping you in ignorance, you know, without you knowing what game they're playing behind the scenes. And that's why it's been really so interesting to watch for the last year as these people go in and, 
you know, outsmart them with the syntax, outsmart them with the, the wordplay, outsmart them with the spell casting is what I call it, right? And it's been exciting to see a lot of wins that way. So when you talk about wins, I think your organization's name, correct me if I'm wrong, is Bonds for the Win, right? Well, I basically re- just started a new organization with Maureen Steele. It's a new people's movement, and it's uh, the People's Operation Restoration. So uh, she and I worked on the nationwide walkout that was basically a stand-up of strike against force mandates. Mm -hmm. Uh, We shut down the whole Golden Gate Bridge. Then we started Bonds for the Win, and she was a big piece of that. And then we, uh, she went on to run the Truckers Convoy, and I supported her behind the scenes. Um, And then we decided to come together and say, you know what? Why not start another people's movement and help all the counties get organized? So they can start standing on the common law practices so they can start holding their, I call them superficial official, you know, holding them accountable for their actions and in teaching, even in just in a sense, we have to start putting people in check. Mm -hmm. They have to. One of the things I think people don't really realize is when you start to break down this, I'll call it a matrix, this deep state control that they have over us. Um, it's really just an illusion. It's an illusion we give power to. And the more that we, um, say no more to that illusion, like I no longer want to contract with this, the more that illusion has to fall. Like imagine if 10% of the people knew the syntax, Mm -hmm. it wouldn't be able to hold. They couldn't, they couldn't keep conning us. It's a big Ponzi scheme. You know, if, um, if only 1% of the people started to actually serve letters, you know, to each of the elected officials, because they're not. They're not public servants. They're elected right. officials for corporations. I, I, I also question whether they're actually elected, but that's another story. Ditto. Because they're <laughs> not. I, I'm not even talking about like just recent elections. I'm talking about going all the way back. I question the legitimacy of every one of them. Me too. I don't think we've had um, a fair and safe election since 1871. And I would argue to say 1878 because that, you know, uh, that act was never even ratified properly. So uh, they you're, you're talking that about on... the 14th Amendment and the Organic Act. They were never actually ratified. Right. right. Yeah. So every single thing, this is a very bold statement, but this is what my research team is bringing back to me. And I really thoroughly agree. But as you know, everything is an unfoldment. Mm-hmm. So don't quote me on this, but every single thing they have done in every court ever since 1878 is literally fraud, which vitiates everything it touches. Mm. So every single precedent, every rule regulation, everybody that's ever been put in jail, it's all based on fraud and it's all based on trickery. And so therefore everything. So I don't think we really had a vote. And let's talk about the term elector, all right? An elector before 1871 was someone who owned land. And that meant they had four votes to one. So we didn't have, you know, we had... um, we had people that had vested interest in the land and they rooted into the land. And so therefore they had a higher, you know, vote. Um, and in, in these cases, these people had legal and equitable title to their land. Right. Right. Well, uh, legal and lawful. Right. Yeah. And so a lot of people, so it's like, that's something I don't think anyone realizes is this has been a massive land grab. It's not just a government grab. It's a land grab. They've stolen mm-hmm all of our land because their goal is to make sure that we have absolutely nothing to pass down from generation to generation while they have everything. And they Mm -hmm. did literally harbor all the world's wealth through these, I'll say Sesta KV trust. Some people like to call them master trust or social security trust. Legacy trust. Yeah. yeah. But like the, the ultimate fact of the matter is you cannot hold the body as surety for a trust, for a a debt that the body doesn't owe. Mm -hmm. You can maybe hold the corporation as surety, but you can't hold the body. So they have been in fraud, you know, since 80s. It's hard for people to wrap their head around that. Well, but yeah, can can you elucidate on that? Because I get what you mean by they cannot hold the body. They can hold the corporation. And I've touched on this before. For those that are listening, the episode with Brandon Joe Williams and also the episode with Cal Washington, we touched on this briefly. But um, what you're talking about there is the difference between you as the living man or woman versus the all caps name that is a corporation that they were that they set up in your name that they trick you into thinking is representative of you the man and it right. is technically your corporation because it is a grant you're the grantor of it but you but it is not you and they trick you into thinking that it is you 
Right. So I kind of, I think visuals would help here a little bit, but I, I, let's just say you're sitting in a crate and the crate is that master trust and this is the body, right? And then this, and then you got a sticker on you and that's what they're accusing. They're actually accusing the sticker of committing a crime. Right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And yeah. the sticker says the all caps name and, but, but I am a living being and no one can prove you're not living. So a lot of people, the think of the body in here, they lean up the body in other words, they put a UCC lean. This is a lot of the truthers and a lot of the influencers out there. They'll put a UCC lean on the body because no one else can truly claim your body except for you. Mm -hmm. And you're the only one who claimed it. So I've got like a you know one trillion dollar lean on my body, uh, not on the person, but on the body. The person right. is the corporation. So again, the person is a sticker. So um, and then you can do that for your children, too. And that does protect them from, you know, outside influence. Like so it protects them from CPS. It protects them from. You know, and so I think people have to realize that what they're doing, though, is they're holding us as debt and they're collateralizing us, mm -hmm. you know, to pay off debt that was um, actually from foreclosures. Uh, I'm sorry, not foreclosures, um, bankruptcies. Right. So, you know, every corporation has to refile bankruptcy or the debt has to be settled every 70 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, my girlfriend, Anne LaFleur, who is one of my lead researchers, she is Really, I'd actually say she's a lead researcher for the entire industry right now. She's just got this innate ability to be able to pull information from just about every document she reads. But like, um, she's the one who helped me with bonds for the win. She's the one who called me up and say, you do realize these people are bonded. They're licensed, bonded and insured, which means they have an oath of office, a bond, which means surety to we the people, which means, hey, if I'm going to be a servant back in the day, I had to put some skin in the game. They would put their house on, you know, up as collateral so that they could be a servant's heart and serve the people under the Republic. And remember, that was more of a trustee situation. We're putting this trust in you. It was, you know, do you want me to go into that or do you want me to? Yeah, absolutely. Please like expand okay. upon this as much as possible in detail, okay. because when it comes to some of these episodes, because I already know a lot of this information for me, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that checks out. But I forget that there are so many people who listen to this that have no concept of what we're talking yeah. about. So as, as much well, detail as possible. Okay. Well, let's just say I'll, I'll simplify it in saying there's four forms of government. Ultimately, there's really only four forms of, well, there's five. I'll say there's five. Two are honorable, three are very dishonorable. As in two will lead you to utopian society, if you can hold it. And two will take you to dystopia, just straight in dystopia. And we need to be aware of that now because we were never taught. But the, the most utopian form of government would be a self-governance where all the needs are met worldwide. Everyone's in a state of world peace. We don't have to, we govern ourselves. You yep. know, when you govern yourself and everybody has an, 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 an interest in maintaining freedom, that would be a utopian type of society. I, I'm an anarcho-capitalist slash voluntarist, so that's where I'm at. But I, I look go. at these common law processes and embodiment as a bridge to get to self-governance. I agree. And I think we all should. I really hope that's where we're actually going. When right. you say the way forward, to me, that's where we should set our sight on, right? right. <laughs> and then the second would be a re re republic. And a republic is based on trust. And I'll come back to that. But the first slip into dystopia would be a democracy. Now, we all ever wants to be democracy, but no, you don't. You really don't. So let's break down what a democracy actually is, and then we'll come back to a republic. But then, then you, you slip into even worse, any form of ism. So a democracy in general is a majority vote. And so that means that there's no one ever there speaking for the little guy. There's no one there voting for the minority. And so it's not based on a moral and ethical vote. It's based on a, well, these more, more people decided this than that. And um, that almost always leads to a disparity in wealth between the rich and the poor and also leads to a dictatorship. So you end up with these dictators who are telling and ruling over. Then well, you well, just in real quick, just the concept of that too, the, the idea that 51% of people, when we talk about quote, the majority, look at the majority of people and it's, in, it's trending in our direction. I'd say, well, look at the majority of people over the last four years, especially at the very beginning, the majority is always misled. The crowd is always misled. So the idea that the crowd could use the mechanism of mechanism of government to wield its, its ideas, um, violently upon the rest of the people is absolutely absurd. It is absurd. Absolutely. And then you immediately slip into some form of ism. So the fourth form of very dystopian government would be an ism of fascism, socialism, you know, Marxism, communism, capitalism. 
But you also then have to consider a fifth form of government. That would be a new world order, one world government. That would be pure dystopia, right? Because now everyone's under the rule of this pope that's, you know, that's got this plausible deniability between him and all of his minions, right? So he's the 1% global elite controlling us, keeping us in a state of argument at all times because, boy, they love doing that. Wars beyond wars that never end, right? So we do not want to back, end up back in that situation. And I think we're in this very, very beautiful precipice right now where the people are actually ready to forge anew. They really are ready to roll up their sleeves and possibly do a 2.0 of our original republic. Like let's resurrect this thing out of the out of the, the dirt by which our forefathers, you know, died on. And let's go ahead and, and rebuild this system. And, and why wouldn't we do amendments and redactments and updates and do you know what I mean? 2.0, 3.0, 4. .0, you know what I mean? Because that's what we're supposed to be doing under a republic. We've just been derelict of our duty. Mm. So yeah, a so republic. Let's talk about the fundamentals of a republic, because it was obvious that our forefathers knew Great Britain. It's like they knew their enemy really well. They knew the corporatocracy that they were leaving because they put, you know what I mean? They, the, the way that they wrote it, you can tell that they put some real thought into this, you know, and they are creating something new. And I think we all need to step into that. Like we're going to step out of the box we've been in. And that we've been MK altered into, and we're going to step into a new way of thinking. And until we do that, because remember, everything starts with an idea. I mean, what was the first time it was like Albert Pike who wrote the 150 year plan to take down the whole entire world with three world wars? Mm -hmm. It all starts with an idea. And though that's a negative idea, I can assure you that if the people rally behind a more positive idea, let's just call it Bill of Rights 3.0, that is fully and completely in uh, in uh, we are fully and completely in agreement with that it accommodates any and all threats that we might have from this modern day enemy because that too is like a creature state it has grown into its own creature you know what i mean Th that we can't just easily dissemble dis dismantle until you build something for people to land in mm. so, so for people to actually start to operate within. Does it make sense? I mean, and I believe in the law of correspondence. It's a closed system. So if we go and remove everyone out of their existing seats, what are they going to do? They're just going to fill them. They're just going to fill those seats with even more people, more evil people, possibly. We have to literally swipe that whole government aside and say, I actually, and this is, I'm actually going to paint a picture because this is very important for people to hear. I want you to picture a road right down the middle, right? And that road is the middle way. It's the parting of the Red Sea. <laughs> The road is extremely critical right now because this is a spiritual ascension journey. And on the left is pure dystopia. Just picture picture everything you've watched, okay? All your politicians are pedos. You know what I mean? They're doing stuff under, you know, uh, to children they should never be doing. It, you know, it's all about compliance. You fundamentally don't agree with it, right? Mm -hmm. And then on the right is utopia. Just picture a whole new promised land. Everything is you know, is restored back to its original republic, but then upgraded. And everybody is operating in a system that they're in full agreement with. So in other words, imagine in that dystopia, the good news is you've never actually been in agreement or signed any agreements under consent with that dystopia. They've assumed and presumed that you have, right? So and this, and this is based in tacit agreements and adhesion contracts, right? Right. Yeah. Like, yes. Yeah. So when you're born and they're doing these things to you and they're putting you under contract, it's C-O-N. And under contract law, contract law spans from the maritime admiralty up to common law and in trust law, because a contract must have up two parties and it must have informed consent. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't read every line of every word in my mortgage statement. I don't know about you. But I didn't know there was a big fat land grab. And I didn't know I was handing my 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 home back over to the state. Mm -hmm. And at the time, too, I didn't even realize that um, they had in my first mortgage. What I found out when I went to get the land patent was that on the deed, they actually signed it over to a whole random trust. So I, I'm sitting there signing, thinking I'm buying a house and I've signed it over to a trust. I've signed it over to the state and I've given them my land. Wow. I think the, the mind F on that too, when it comes to mortgages, is that when you give them your social to get a mortgage, they go to the Federal Reserve window and pull down the credit from you. Meaning from you, that you paid they for are, it. Yeah, they're lending you your own credit and then you're making payments on it at interest. And the bank cannot prove that they've ever lent you a dime. Right. 
So when well, banks you aren't allowed a, to lend money according to the U.S. codes. They're not allowed to lend money. They can only lend credit, and it's credit that is created by our signatures and initially by our birth certificate account. Exactly. And, you know, they'll get you to where, like, I know some people that have gone forth and gotten the banks in default for not being able to prove that they funded the loan. And I'm just, so I'm just really quick, I'm going to talk about that really quick because this is fascinating. There's a big difference between an advertment, which is a statement, and a negative advertment. Have you researched that at all? Because yep. it took me a while to, you know, not only really master it, but I wasn't actually using it. I'm just trying to teach it. <laughs> and so I want people to hear this because this would be going in an affidavit of truth or in a writ of core warranto. So those are two very similar instruments. An affidavit of truth would be your own personal testimony. Imagine sitting on a testimony stand under penalty of perjury. You have to have personal firsthand knowledge of the situation at hand, right? So it's your loan or you were pulled over by a police officer or whatever, right? Or you were, you were summoned to the court or whatever. So you in your personal testimony have to use a statement that puts the burden of proof on them, mm. right? So I'm going to give you two statements and I want you to tell me which one you think might be a bit stronger. Okay. So the first statement would be to the bank under burden of proof, prove to me there was no bank or fraud. Right. But the second statement would be, there is no evidence to prove there was no bank or fraud. There's no evidence to prove you've ever funded this loan. Do you see how, when you force evidence upon them, you are not the one having to do the evidence work you for, it's like, you're saying I summon you to court because I have a serious, strong reason to believe you never funded this loan. So you banker need to come with the evidence, which they can't because they have to sell these mortgages every five years upstream. They can't even hold the debt for more than five years. So they can't even provide you for your original mortgage statement or signatures or anything like that. That's what's fascinating to me. And not one brokerage company can fork that over. And so that tells you that they're an immediate default because they can't come with evidence. Do you see the power of that right. negative advertment statement? And, so and this, no is, this is a prove. problem when it comes to discharge, as I've learned it, like being able to discharge your mortgage because they can't actually validate that you're the debtor in that relationship, right? Um, is that it's trying to figure out which bank actually holds the note for the home at that time, since it's traded and traded right, it's and traded. traded. Yeah, exactly. But that's another one, a note versus a permissory note. Do you know the difference? Cause that's also another con one is a payable and one's a receivable. Mm -hmm. So they're giving you a permissory note that's saying, I promise to pay very different than a note that is a payable. And oftentimes they're giving you a statement <laughs> it's very twisted. And that's why once you have a few of these common law academies, common law groups like Living Law Society, Common Law Academy, I think you had a gentleman that you had interviewed a little while ago that's providing lawful service. I don't know if you want to promote him. But, you know, at the end of the day, um, we have remedy. We just have to know the system. And once everyone knows a system, the system has to fall. It's going to get too much pressure because it's all based on fraud to begin with. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think that what we're talking about here just kind of shows the futility of voting in at all, like doing any of that nonsense, especially because you're still playing the corporate game within their corporate de facto governance system, which is not even a true government. And you're right. just an agent of that corporation if you keep on playing that game. Exactly. So then, then I really want to bring it back to that dystopia versus utopia. Where do you want to spend your mind? Where do you want to spend your time, money, effort, and attention? Because what you resist will persist and what you invest in and manifest in will become. And that's what we have to do as a collective, right? Because if we keep putting our time and attention. So when I talk about that dystopia, in this dystopia, the good news is you're not actually bound. See, bound, that's another very spiritual word, a bond is your word. Mm -hmm. Your word is your oath. Your word is what you claim to be and to, and will do. That's your free will, but it's still, once you say you will, you must, right? So um, when we agreed, which we didn't as children, that's actually not the right word. When we were contracted with, contract, we weren't in agreement, we were in contract. So the truth is in that dystopia, you've actually been in a fundamental disagreement with what that government is doing versus what you want to do. And here's why, because they think they're the master in the relationship and you think you're the master. 
right? So in that dystopian side, they keep you in a state of argument and ignorance. Okay. So remember, I talked about the four forms of government. There's four doors to any presentment. And this is very powerful when people actually figure this out, you know what I mean? Because this will shift everything. If people really start truly understanding the fundamental power of these four doors of presentment. So in, in, in again, the four doors, there's two that are honorable, two that are dishonorable. So to be the most honorable, you would walk in acceptance and equity. And again, we can come back to that and dissect it, but that's how Jesus walked. And we can talk more about it. That's what they're teaching in the Bible, acceptance and equity. The second form of response would be a conditional acceptance, like, sure, I'll contract with you guys if you can prove jurisdiction. But other than that, I really don't want a contract. That gets you out, doesn't save the matrix, right? Gets you out. And then that's good because the more people that get themselves out is good. But let's say you have 10% of people that know this and they get out. You're still trapped in a matrix system. We've got to all get out, right, at some point. Um, the, the thing has to come down at some point. But the the two other forms of response to a presentment is argument. And then the lowest form would be ignorance to totally ignore or just comply, because then that keeps the whole system funded, if you will. Um, so they love in that left you dystopian to keep us in a state of argument. Right. Even when I went to serve Maricopa County with the paperwork and holding them personally liable for all their actions, which I think everyone needs to do right away is put them on notice. And the notice is really a notice of personal liability. And I also gave them a 5,000 page document, which is a Keras report project. People can go check that out. It's a forensics report that covers all of the high crimes. And we don't need to list them today. But I basically dropped that on their lap. And I said, from this day forth, you're accountable for this. In other words, if you don't send a public broadcast out to all 4.5 million residents in Maricopa County, notifying them of the dangers of this thing, then you are going to be held personally accountable for that because high crimes are treasonous. Covering up high crimes is just as treasonous. Mm -hmm. So when I dropped words like insurrection, I don't know if you saw that video, kind of went viral. Uh -huh. um, I dropped words like, yeah, we've taken it another step. We've taken bonds for the wind another step because we're now using the common law to notify these selected officials, these superficial officials, that they are not who they think they are. Right. And that's because they don't have an oath of office signed to we the people. They've signed one to a corporation. So they have absolutely nothing to do with our original republic. And they're posing and masquerading. Two, they don't have an oath because they're only oath to each other. I'm sorry, a bond. They don't have a bond. They're supposed to be bonded to us and they don't. And I know that through the Bonds for the Win project because we audited them worldwide. Mm -hmm. And we know none of their bonds were paying out. Not a single bond paid out. So if if I can't file a claim against your surety bond, do you have one? Right. You know, I, don't I, I have think a so. question on that real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so knowing that as of 1871, all of these officials that are operating within the government as agents of the government are really just part of a corporation and they're just basically employees of a corporation to some degree or agents of a corporation. Given that that is the case, this this superficial de facto overlay has been laid upon the de jure form of of government that previously existed. Is is it is doing these processes sort of how do I put this? Like, are are, are we trying to hold them accountable within their corporation? Is I guess the question that I'm asking because, like if they're operating in that capacity and whether they realize it or not, because the overwhelming majority of them don't actually know, right? Um, it's that they're still doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing as employees of that corporation. So how can we be holding them accountable for, you know, doing what they're doing for the corporation? I think, because I think you get what I'm asking. Because it's implied they're masquerading. And yeah. so, yes, on paper, they work for McDonald's, but they're masquerading as government. And that is so. And then that's kind of the David Jose camp, right? The David Jose group and, you know, Ron Bouchard and them, uh, you know, they're using a slightly different approach, but mm -hmm. still every bit as effective, if not more, because it's even more efficient. They're saying, look, I don't even care if you have an oath of office. Your oath of office is implied and right. your only job as a, as a legislative branch is to uphold our rights, which you're not doing. So whether or not you say you are, or you are on paper, you're saying that this is what you've, you know, that you're signed up for. Therefore we can hold you accountable because as a living man, you're not doing as you say you would, you know what I'm saying? You are her harming the people. So I wouldn't want to be 
um, you know, one of the nine members of the board of supervisors in Maricopa County looking out over 4.5 million people, because as soon as those 4.5 million people realize that you're a fraud and you're personally liable for it and you're working for, you know, um, a corporation that has absolutely nothing to do with our government, then we realize that you're just a like almost like an actor in a movie. Mm -hmm. And you're posing, you know, so and then it's like not only that, but they're not just an actor in a movie. They are. They are our oppressors. They are the redcoats. We never won the, the Revolutionary War. You're literally looking and talking to a redcoat that's there to, to appease you and keep you entertained as they red stamp everything on behalf of the New World Order. Yeah. And they don't care what you think or say because they've got five other coffer accounts. And I think a lot of people like the David Jose camp and, and those guys, like they're really like all about fundamental law, which is awesome because they're keeping in that lane. But if you come back a step out of it and you look at the the devil's strategy, I don't know what else to call it. <laughs> you know, the strategy is based on money. It's based yeah. on follow the money. And as a corporation, they get to write all the rules. They get to corral you into those rules. They get to bypass the bill of rights. And so long as they fool you and keep you fooled, you're stuck. And it's, a, it's also a very sticky relationship. And you think about how brilliant it is. It's like, such a sticky relationship that we as slaves start bickering with each other because we're so frustrated at how deep this goes. Mm -hmm. And that's another way they keep us in argument, you know? So to step completely out of it is to say, okay, I accept ac acceptance and equity. I accept this is dystopia. And I actually don't really want to contract with it. I don't even want to get triggered by it. In fact, from this day forth, I'm not even going to set foot in their corporate office, which they call a public building, but I don't actually think it's no. public. I none mean, of, none of them are. It's... None of them are. Yeah, I don't think the court is public. I don't think that the, you know, these, they're all commercial. Every one of them right. is commercial. Well, but I think that they use trust to privatize their things. So they have, they probably, and I know the Rothschilds, how they structure their trust. They've got multiple trusts. So think of like a separate coffer account for per trust, per liability. And then they create one trust that's interfacing with the public that they might call public. But that's still just the this one little tiny trust where they're there to appease us. So it's like going to McDonald's and saying, hey, please help us from the border. And McDonald's is going to say, yeah, that's a non-issue. Right. Don't worry. We got you. Well, because they're the ones invading you. Right. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like they're the ones planning the invasion. And, and it is subversion and very, very, very manipulative to the masses. Another question I have with respect to 1871, the Organic Act, and then the 14th Amendment, which was around that time, and the subsequent amendments after that, and then, of course, the Maternity Act in 1921, which set forth the birth certificate, the Emergency Banking Act in 1933, I think all of these things sort of made it so the, the corporate entity that is the U.S. government was, was fully um, in effect, let's say. And... Um, as I've come to understand it, the original Republic is no longer in existence whatsoever. It literally converted to this corporate entity. And um, I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is the, is the process you're describing reestablishing the Republic or is it coming from the premise that the Republic itself still exists? It's just not an operation because those are two distinct differences there. They really are. And you are in a, you're right over the target there. And that's something that I think a lot of the truthers on the front line right now are still trying to connect the dots. Uh, I call them frontliners because they're digging deep into history, into law forms that we've been, um, that, that have been completely erased, you know, from our, um, uh, our education and our knowing. Um, so, so to answer that question, a lot of people believe that that a trust can never fail for lack of a trustee mm -hmm. and that those republics are still there. They're just vacated and that we need to do exactly as the, it was laid out for us to do um, to actually uh, restand them. Okay. In other words, if we don't stand them up properly, they will consider us to be forming a dual society and or, you know, doing something that's insurrectionist ourselves. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of sensitivity to that, to that question. What I think we need to do is do the amendments, because here's another crazy thing you want to go deeper is that the Constitution. Many will say we're not even a party to. Why? Because it's we the people and the W is caps and the P is caps. Do you know who we the people really are? Right. They're the Illuminati. 
So it's a contract for them. It's not even, we're not even a party to right. it. And it was never even fully properly ratified. So some people are going all the way back to the Articles of Confederation and trying to build that baseline. That's so, why I'm an anti-federalist guy myself. If if I yeah. was back in that time, I probably would have been an anti-federalist. Right. I mean, I think that the forefathers were on the run. I really do. I think that they formed separate states as origin, like as their own country. Mm. And the only reason they formed that union, because they knew how just, just the Pope owning a sliver of Delaware would cause another insurrection. Yeah. You know, so at the time then they knew they had to form a union to protect against foreign invasion. But they knew that they that the more that they could spread out, and have multiple republics, the less chance they'd be invaded. Mm. All the republics, right? But of course, the deep states are very rich. They they know how to for, you know fund both sides of every war. There was so much going on with President Lincoln. You know, he he came in, and I think he saw all the writing on the wall. I think he was assassinated for a reason. Um, he had a gun to his head for most of his presidency, but he still was able to see these thirty five at the time thirty five republics, separate sovereign countries were in danger. So he then created a, a, a trust, a wrapper trust. And through the Gettysburg Address, it was called the public trust. He, it's that, that's basically the trust indenture where he takes all 35 of those states and he wraps them into another trust, wherein the executor, again, is, is God. The trustee are the public servants, but if they fail or they fail for lack of the trust, then the military has you know, pr the protective ability uh, to protect all 35 of those states. And then again, we are the uh, beneficiaries, the uh, inheritant, uh, inheritors of this trust. Mm. So um, I do believe that Lincoln protected us. Not only did he do that, he tried to make us uh, separate from a monetary perspective with the greenback. So he, he did a lot of good work, but then I think he got assassinated because he couldn't be controlled. Mm. And they might have found out about that. So that's my point is when you really start following the history, you start to see how much this enemy despises a republic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that and despises people who are, let's say, exiting their system via a series of processes. Because I think what we're talking about here is, in general, two different approaches. One is calling them on their BS and saying, okay, what you're claiming to be, you're not actually that. You're still just a man or a woman. I'm a man or a woman, and we're on level playing field. I'm not a uh, party to your corporation, no matter how much you say I am this all caps name. And then the other approach in general would be saying, okay, all of these various contractual obligations that I wasn't even aware that I was entered into in some cases, and some I signed willingly, whether the driver's license, et cetera, et cetera, and then revoking those contracts to basically get you out of the jurisdiction of the U.S. government. Is that kind of how you see it in the two different ways? Yes, but I think we can, I think we can level up from there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that is operating in conditional acceptance, right? Because you're saying I, the man, I don't care if I'm one man out of 5 billion or 7 billion. I want to be free. And you go through those processes and you know who you are and you know who they are. And now you're living over here in this utopia and you're free, but you're all alone. <laughs> How's that helping everybody? What's that doing with dystopia over here? What's that doing with the matrix? You know, we have to see how to operate in acceptance and equity. And that means I now accept as a collective, not just me. I accept that we're part of a slave system and we all want to break free. Mm -hmm. So imagine here again, you're not, you're, the good news is you're actually floating around in space over here in this dystopia because you're not in agreement. You're not in agreement. You didn't sign it. You never agreed to these things. So when you look at the contracts versus agreement, now you're going to walk in acceptance of how things are. You're going to walk in agreement for how things are. And you're going to walk in equity, meaning you're investing in a new way. Mm. You're investing in revising and updating the original republics, setting a tone, you know what I mean, for future republics, uh, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, all those things need to be considered in the Bill of Rights and others, many other documents, probably we need to forge a constitution properly. And we do need to figure out what those steps are to the promised land, but we cannot continue to expect to change the system. If we stay in a state of conditional acceptance, because it only gets that out of that one sticky situation, we've got to get the whole party to move. So on the right, imagine literally like a little sign that just says, hey, you want to join the Freedom Party? You want to be a free man? 
Uh, living, do you want to be living? You want to come back to the land of the living? No longer be operating as dead corpse. You come over here and you walk in agreement with, and see, that's the thing. We all need to really realize that a signature, a sign of nature is a very spiritual thing. This shows the world in scribe what you are walking in agreement of and what you are party to. Mm -hmm. So in the future, I think every contract or document or agreement, I prefer the term agreement or covenant, needs to be so easy to read and so easy to take a litmus test after that you fundamentally and formally agree with what you're now going to do. Because yeah. then you're setting yourself off in a totally different direction. Now, if we could get millions of people to join that freedom party, now you're in the new frontier. Now you're in a state where you actually have some power. And now I want you to build like a little tunnel underneath that, that road. That's the post office. From now on, we only serve them from the post. We don't even show up over on that. We don't even need to participate or be party to that other side of the road. Aside just from putting them going, on notice saying, hey, we're doing this. No, I'm saying is like, we don't ever go into their courts. We, we, yes, you're right. Like you have to notify once we, once you build a new and you've got a system where you've got a stronghold, a refuge, mm -hmm. call it the freedom party, call it a social compact, call it whatever you want. Cause that's what it needs to be. It needs to be a, like a social compact. We could go into that. I'm still learning the difference between a PMA, a social contract, compact and a trust. Yeah, But I'm pretty sure a social compact was laid out by the forefathers for what we're supposed to do when there is government overreach. And what, what's important with this, though, as I've learned, is that it's important that you state that it is unincorporated because... Yes, it's the, an unincorporated it has, association. Yes, it has to be unincorporated. But it's in the public yeah. because it has to be a public offering or they'll accuse you of a secret society or a parallel society. Mm -hmm. So when it's in a public offering, you go, what do you mean? What? You got a problem with the Freedom Party? Here's our... Here's our agreement. Is there a problem with that, sir? You know what I mean? Like, is there a problem with us wanting to be free? And if so, that is becomes a real consciousness choice. You know, if they come up against us for trying to be free, what are they? Well, they look more and more tyrannical. Does that right. make sense? It creates this disparity where more people want to come over to the Freedom Party, even people that are more liberal. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Who want to be a part of building a better future, part of building a better, you know, environment, you know, if they're concerned about global warming or whatever, you know what I mean? There's something in the Freedom Party for everybody. Yeah. If you're enjoying this episode, please consider sharing it with at least one friend or family member who you think could benefit from hearing it. You help us grow and reach more people by sharing it with those around you. Also, be sure to head to the show notes to check out our membership offerings, membership marketplace, and more. We all know that big ag is poisoning our food supply and big pharma's so-called medicine is straight up poison. What most people aren't aware of though is that most supplements are also filled with artificial sweeteners, dyes, GMOs, glyphosate, and a host of other toxic ingredients, even many of the more natural supplements. My good buddy James Benefico dedicated his life to crafting the world's cleanest, most nutritious organic supplements after a pre-workout energy drink caused heart palpitations so severe that he almost landed up in the ER. Organic Muscle was born, revolutionizing sports nutrition by using exclusively non-GMO ingredients from USDA organic farms. Since then, tens of thousands of people, including myself, have leveled up their fitness and their health with Organic Muscle's award-winning natural pre-workout. There's no jitters, no heart palpitations, no itchy skin, just nourishing organic food and herb-based ingredients for clean, sustained energy, strength, endurance, and recovery. Numerous studies have shown that Tonka Ali is the most effective herb in the world for naturally boosting testosterone levels. We know that testosterone levels are depleting all over the world because of what's put in the food supply, what we're exposed to, Organic Muscle has the world's first fully organic Tonka Ali supplement. I only support and promote things that I actually use and I can say I legitimately use Organic Muscle products. Use code FORWARD15 at checkout for 15% off at organicmuscle.com. Are you getting enough magnesium in your diet? If you live in the modern world, it's pretty likely that you aren't. Because our soil, food, and water supply are deficient in magnesium, many of us are as well. Magnesium is one of the most essential electrolytes of the body. It plays a crucial role in cellular hydration, muscle and brain function, the electrical functions of our body, energy production, and sleep. Magnesium Breakthrough from BioOptimizers is the best magnesium supplement on the market. 
where most magnesium supplements provide maybe two forms of magnesium. Magnesium Breakthrough from BioOptimizers contains seven different forms of magnesium and is made from all natural ingredients to deliver optimal magnesium levels to the body. And unlike many synthetic magnesium supplements, Magnesium Breakthrough is free from additives, fillers, and artificial ingredients. It is formulated using ingredients of the highest quality, including cofactors to multiply the delivery of magnesium to every cell in your body and absorb at a very high rate. In our household with two young kids running around, for my wife and I, sleep is probably the biggest concern. And we both notice a huge difference in our quality of sleep when we're taking Magnesium Breakthrough regularly. There's a reason that it's BioOptimizer's best-selling product, and that speaks volumes because they have a ton of amazing products in their store. Nurture your mind and body with this all-natural, full-spectrum magnesium supplement. Simply go to biooptimizers.com forward slash Alec and use promo code Alec10 during checkout to save 10%. And if you subscribe, not only will you get amazing discounts and free gifts, you'll make sure your monthly supply is guaranteed. I think that, um, so for me as a voluntarist slash anarcho-capitalist, as I've been learning all this common law stuff in conjunction with voluntarist philosophy over the last four years, that's where I've increasingly come to the position that the it, common law and voluntarism are really saying the same thing in general. It's that the only crime, if there is one, is one that violates the principle of non-aggression, which is a voluntarist term, or commits a, quote, common law crime where you're injuring someone, killing someone, or injuring their property. And that's the only true crime that there is. And when you're talking about with this new way of being that all contracts should be really easy to read and laid out so that everyone knows the terms, you know, the seven like tenets of a contract, the meeting of the minds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that literally is what most voluntarists want. They just want a society based in totally voluntary agreements. And I think that and I've, I've done this historically too. I've sort of looked at anything with government on it as fundamentally bad. Anything is like forming a, a group that, that requires that um, you obey quote laws as bad because that could be corruptible. And I guess what I'm learning now is that as long as we have the the same general foundation and agreement that everything within whatever this construct is or this society is is based in totally voluntary interactions i don't give a shit what you call it it's like that's all any of us want is just to be able to say no i don't want to do that and it's like okay then you don't have to do that like as long as you don't harm anyone else you don't have to do anything like you don't have to do anything you don't want to do as long as you do not harm anyone else totally fine and if it, i want to do I that could then not I agree more to. i could not agree more but we do have to still come up with a way to take down corporations that are doing tremendous damage to mm -hmm. the people, whether it is a McDonald's, because they're doing quite a bit of damage too. one could argue. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, if you're a government and you're saying that you're watching over and protecting, but yet you're allowing for a foreign insurrection over the border and you're allowing for, for you know, forced vaccines in certain, you know, um, corporate uh, environments, et cetera, you're, you're actually causing harm. And so you should be served for that. You're causing harm. You, that individual who's holding that position or that seat in that corporation is causing harm. So if you were to serve everyone at McDonald's and put them on notice, that really is the only thing you can do is let them know, hey, you might not know because you voluntarily signed up to work for McDonald's. You might not know that the food is poison. Do you know what I mean? And so here now, you know, Yeah. this was a very interesting little experiment. Um, we had some kids. And we did a little common law trial by peers, you know, sim. And we said, you've got a nurse on the stand. She's accidentally killed a hundred people. Um, she didn't know the dangers of this thing, you know, um, with it, when she was injecting people with this vaccine, her doctors told her to do it. The medical board told her to do it. Google told her to do it. The news told her to do it. She really thought she was saving lives. I said, but a hundred people have died and now she's crying on the stand. I said, what do you think? Is she guilty or not guilty? And they said, and what, I guess what my question to you is, what do you think the kids said? I would bet the kids said she's guilty. They said not guilty they because she didn't guilty. know. Yeah. If you don't know better, you can't do better. And she was fooled. I said, and I said, okay, so let's say you notify her now. And now she knows. So now she, she can't be fooled because you gave her the evidence. Right. And I said, and then she went and continued to inject people. And then, you know, another three people died. I said, is she guilty then? And they said, Absolutely. 
So this is the thing. If we don't start putting them in check and on notice, if we don't start using some of these notices and remember a notice isn't even the actual suit, right? It's just a, Hey, you know what? You keep doing this and we're going to have to give you this common law suit. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so whether it be in a form of a ridicule warranto or any other writ, or whether it be in a form of an affidavit of truth, we're letting you know, if you keep doing this, we're going to do that. It's like, Right. How else would you put a child in check? You know what I mean? You'd have to let them know the consequence. Two, two questions on that. One is that, again, when we're operating within the construct of this corporate system of government, and we are, I guess, in this process, are you disidentifying with the all caps name through these through these series of notices? Because my, my point, to, my point, my yeah, point yeah. is from as as I've come to understand it, and I'm of course open to being wrong, is that if you are not pulling yourself out of their jurisdiction, then you are still operating in their system and you don't have rights within that system. You don't have rights within the corporate fictitious, fictitious government. I I don't really agree with that. Your rights are fundamental, like they're 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 fundamental under the maxims of law. You don't need a corporation to give you rights or grant you rights. And you, no one can prove you're not living. Mm -hmm. So when you stand on, okay, acceptance in equity is to say, I accept who I am and I accept who you are. I'm not here to question the jurisdiction or the facts of this matter, nor am I here to, and this is what Jesus did when he turned the tables. This is how he did it. He went into the courts and he, and they said, who are you? And are you, you know, so-and-so he says, no, I, he says, I accept who I am and I accept who you are. In other words, I know you're a fraud mm -hmm. and I know I'm living. Right. Therefore, I'm here to settle the matter in the public debt. I'm here to appear. I'm here to uh, review my appearance bond. Mm -hmm. And you could do this today yep. because, you know, it's a tax matter. You know, they're trading you under the table. You know, this is a banker you're dealing with. So if you know you're dealing with a banker and you're telling him, show me the banking, show me this appearance bond. And the, the judge has to give it to the bailiff. The bailiff has to give it to you. You can sign in your all caps name, bottom left to top right, and then write resend and the date. Or if, you, or if you know it. someone, you can just pull down the Q-sip and walk in with yourself and say, hey, I have this. Or you're, you can go to treasurydirect.gov now and you can prove that they've opened a bond in your name because you can pull up the case file. You can see all the bonds are opening and you can come and show and be like, here I am. I'm here to settle the matter. <laughs> and you're just going to resend it because it's all fraud. Right. And so what Jesus was doing was he was turning the tables on the money changers. He knew they were trading doves, which I believe are children. And he, and he said, look to the people, look what I just caught them in. He caught them in the act. Mm -hmm. See, that's operating in acceptance. Then the people can see that, he, you know, this is how the system works because when the people know they do better, mm -hmm. right? So once the people know they don't like participate in that anymore. So um, again, it's all about giving people voluntary options. So when, when we stand against them, we don't have to be a corporation in that situation. We can be the living man. We can be the living man there to settle the debt. Okay. Got it. The, the second part that makes sense. The second part to that question, um, was related to us not having to question jurisdiction, as you're saying here, and we just come in with this acceptance process essentially or acceptance um not process really but like way of being let's say right coming in like with acceptance through equity so with that though if let's say we are trying to hold a man or a woman in a position within that corporation accountable for committing crimes against humanity let's say like based on forced vaccinations or things like this the other thing that i've learned is that through Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, uh, common law at the federal level is gone. So when we put them on notice and then say, we're going to do this, whether that's file suit against you, charge you for X amount in damages, blah, 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 blah. Is that actually actionable, let's say, um, given that Erie Railroad versus Tompkins basically negated common law in any way at the federal level, and now it's all commercial? Well, was that a federal corporate court? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so it's all fraud. Was it after 1878? You know? Yeah. It's all fraud. So again, I can tell you watching these folks, and these are geniuses. They're very brave. 
frontliners serving this paperwork to the judges. I mean, so it's like, here's the judge sending you all these, they put you in this docket, they've got you in this, you know, uh, case file. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to accuse you, which they have no basis for doing and because they're accusing your corporation. Can right. a corporation they're not accusing run a red you light? as a man. Right. Right. They're not accusing you. They're cor- accusing your corporation of committing a crime and a corporation cannot commit a crime. Mm. So everything is already fraud on its face in that maritime. When you start serving them documents like behind the scenes, like through the mail or the post registered mail, Because in the common law, and I don't know if you've told your people this, but I'll just repeat it because it's important. Under the common law, our magistrate is the notary. Mm -hmm. So we don't need to go in their courts. They could summon us to those courts, but we can send them, you know, um, these common law documents, whether it be affidavits or writs via the, our people's court, which is the post office that's registered mail. So you have it signed and submitted and registered through the notary. Then you send it through registered mail, and that's the submission to the court. And upon receipt, you have verified receipt. So they cannot claim that you didn't submit the paperwork to the court. And that's what I mean is we don't even have to go in that house. Mm-hmm. We, we don't have to. And I'm seeing judges recuse themselves. They all know the game. Mm-hmm. They all know when they're getting outsmarted. They all know they're liable. Mm-hmm. So then you say, well, there's no remedy. Like no one's getting paid out on these debt instruments. So, I mean, fundamentally, again, the first thing you do is put them on notice because you got to give them 30 days to make a better choice or whatever. It may be some give less days because they're tired of the notices taking and dragging out 30 days or down to 10 days. Um, isn't that, isn't that in give, the uniform commercial code, though, that it has to be at least 30 days or is that am I incorrect in that? I mean... In a notice, it doesn't. In a okay. writ or or a affidavit, you do have to give them yeah. the 30, 60, 90, right? Yeah. So I'm talking about the notice, like, hey, cease and desist. The notice okay. is a yellow card, everybody. It's like, it's not like a, you're not actually serving them lawfare that they're personally liable for. You're telling them what you're going to do. And you have mm-hmm. to pre-warn them. That is a courtesy. Yep. Here's your yellow card, because you can't really give a red card till you give a yellow card. So then when you give the red card, like I said, it's it's a writ or the or the um or the affidavit, and that's giving them a time frame. So again, in a perfect writ or affidavit, you're giving them a notice and an opportunity to cure. Mm. Um, and so that with they they have to provide proof in order to cure. And if they can't come with proof, then they slip into what's called default judgment. And that's just like what's happening with a traffic ticket. You get a traffic ticket. See, they're using this lawfare against us, but all we're doing is flipping the playbook and using their same tools right back at them. So when you get a ticket, it's got a 30 day, right? Timeline where you have to either show up at court to prove your innocence or you have to pay your ticket. And then it falls into default judgment, which means you accept your guilty plea, you pay your ticket, and then, you know, you go on about your day. Well, what you don't know is that in that court file, they're opening a trust in your name. They're putting a bid of performance and a payment bond inside that trust. They're trading you on those markets. They're making anywhere from two to $5 million per ticket. And that means that every single police officer is trafficking your person. Mm -hmm. He is part of a massive, I would say, you know, crime syndicate because he's holding a gun and he is attempting to traffic your person. And your person is the corporation. Mm -hmm. So he can't even contract with you. So you could literally say to that cop, like, Excuse me, sir. Are you trying to? Are you attempting to traffic my person? And you could hand him a yellow card and be like, "Yeah, just so you know, you're personally liable for about a million dollars because there's no evidence to prove you don't work for a foreign corporation. There's mm-hmm. no evidence to prove that you're a police officer upholding the police for the republic. There's no evidence to prove you didn't just hold me at gunpoint, and there's no evidence to prove that you didn't just force me out of duress and and fear of going to jail." or losing my driver's license to sign a document. That's a forced duress document that you just made me sign in order to traffic my person. So, I mean, if we were to just notify, just notify the police precincts of the con that they're in, because let's, let's assess what we're dealing with here. You're dealing with a minion army. These are people that probably want to protect the public. Yeah. And they they don't want to harm the better. public. Yeah. They don't know better. They are not trying to hurt anyone. You know, they've been manipulated into these seats. That's why notices are so effective. If we could notice them. So I want to, I'm looking at building the new, you know, the new social compact, the, Mm. the let's give people a choice to be free. Mm. Let's give them voluntarily choice to be free. Join this freedom group or this freedom party. This is, you know, I am party to being free. Right. And then, and then from there we forge alliances with one another and we serve them. 
and we create a big defect, like defect. Like we want everyone to defect over into this concept where we have du jour. Everything is du jour over here because du jour to me means I've signed an oath to the people versus I've signed an oath to the corporate government. Mm-hmm. And when you when you have people signing oaths to corporate governments, they are de facto. They are non-fact. They're de fact, void of fact. When you get people into real agreements and you can create a defection, uh, a defect over, now you really weakened, really weakened this minion army, this 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 grasp that they have over us, this mm-hmm. this tight. You know, again, I'm all about let's actually effectuate mass change. Yeah. I don't want to be. I don't want anyone to be. A slave anymore. I think we should all be free. I think, I think world peace is is more attainable now than it's ever been because we're learning these fundamental principles. Well, and there's a huge bifurcation right now. And again, that's why I brought up the whole point of there's there's voluntarists who think like, ah, oh, we don't need to do any of that stuff. Just stop believing that they have authority over us. And I actually agree with that. But then there's multiple ways. I guess my point is there's multiple ways to go about this. There, there but this is the cool ways. thing is with these notices, you essentially defunct their authority. Right. Because it's just, again, it, it, and I'm, I would like to talk in parables because it's easier to comprehend. But if you're giving them a yellow card and then you're giving them a red card, in the case of Maricopa County, what I did was, and this is a three-step process, I served them with the notice that says, hey, I have reason to believe you don't have oaths, you don't have bonds. You have never been certified in this election. You've never investigated voter fraud and you're masquerading as government. And that's a $1.7 million based on title 18 fees and codes. I'm sorry, title 18, um, you know, fee structure that, that this is $1.75 million in personal liability to you, Mr. Board of Supervisors and each member of the Board of Supervisors. And with 12 signatures, which is a council of 12. Think of how powerful that is. Think of getting into a jury. You sit in a jury and then you all agree, you deliberate and you agree, you know, something we need to take this action. All 12 of you sign. That's more deliberate than one signature, right? That's not one person with a stick against the machine. If you can get a council of 24, that's even better. Mm -hmm. So powerful. That's a very biblical, you know, term, the number, the elders, and you you get it, you get that level of agreement, and then you serve them. Now you're serving them anywhere from if it's a council of 12, $21 million in personal liability per person. Mm-hmm. If you have a council of 24, it's you know, 20 and and, that, and that's just 12 of 4.5 million mm-hmm. people in Maricopa. You know what I'm saying? So you serve them by giving them notice. Then the next step in that rid, I was saying, okay, hold on a minute. You didn't rebut the notice and you didn't do anything. So now you're even more liable because you're sitting on this research and you didn't put out a public broadcast, which means now you are really operating and behaving like a tyrant. I caught you in the act. The non-action is an action. Mm -hmm. So I caught you in the cover-up and you've never proven to me who you are. So now the writ of Quaranto was basically saying under what authority and holy crap, you better give me your identification now. It's just like a cop saying, give me your ID. Why don't we ask the cop for his ID? Right. I'm wondering what authority you have to pull me over. Show me your ID. Why don't we do that? So in this case, I'm asking them, show me your oath now, because I just showed you evidence that it's not an oath. And if you can't show me evidence that it is an oath to the Republic, then you are absolutely masquerading and you are a tyrant. And I have to hold you accountable. And so what you do then is if they go into default and they don't show you their identification, then they fall into default judgment. So now you're racking up a debt, right? You're debting the debtors of society. I don't care if you don't get paid out on the debt. This is a spiritual war. They don't care when they get paid out on our debt instruments. They look at it over the long term. So imagine now you got everyone who leaves dystopia. They're over here in utopia. They've all signed an agreement. It's so simple. It's like a one page. You're like, yeah, I want to be free. Yeah. They're all in the freedom party. They're signing in groups of 12. They're serving underground through the mail. <laughs> Don't even enter in there because it's a trap. It's a January 6th trap. You do not want to enter their house. And because you don't want to argue. Right. You don't want to argue. You got to get out of arguing. You, their game. Out. you don't yeah. want to argue because they'll keep you in that argument. And then you're, when you, people need to be conscious of when they're in a state of argument versus acceptance and equity. I am in would, would you consider protesting another form of argument? Because yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm very against protests. Her. 
Right. Argument is a loop. Right. Acceptance and equity is investing in what you want. Invest from, in what from, you from want. A, from a spiritual perspective too, so, though. Like So the, right now, let me just really quick. Yeah. On the utopian, on the free people, we're in debt, right? Because they're putting us in debt. Now you start to create a defection. Everyone's defecting. So the police are like, I don't want this liability. Yeah. The school districts are like, I don't want this liability. The, you know, all, all the minions at the bottom have now defected over here. So they don't have much to stand on anymore. They may have coffer accounts, but I do believe those are getting shut off too because of the currency stuff happening. Um, and also we do need to mention this. And I, this is an unknown loophole. I don't think people realize that in 1933, FDR actually made those SESTA KV trusts assets to the corporation. Right. So what happens when the corporation is dissolved? I mean, we're talking for, I don't even remember. It was like four point something. I don't know. I mean, what was the number? I don't know the number, but it was in the quadrillions. From, what I've, from what I've heard, the national debt is actually the amount that is in all of our SESTA KV trusts. No, it's the amount that they drew from our SESTA KV trust yes. that they owe back to us. Yes, that, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Yeah. yeah. And they had built, okay, I picture that. The IRS was supposed to be a debt, like a, a, a credit debt type of settle the uh, settle the matter. Right. You were supposed to, and they, you didn't know this, people didn't know this, but it's so messed up. Anything you pretty much buy with your credit card, they're drawing from your assessed KV. Right. Under the assumption and presumption that you're going to pay it back later because they're like, oh, well, she says she's good for it. So they're getting double paid when you pay your statement. Right. You were supposed to pay the statement, sorry, and you were supposed to be able to then go take that to the IRS at the end of each year and get a credit back. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what you're supposed to do. But this is, again, it's like the devil has his ways. Imagine a huge chicken coop and there's a tiny little doggy door, but it's only open as free range for like one hour a day. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And the yep. chicken coop and all the chickens are having to beat, you know, like kind of peck off each other to get all the way to that little door. <laughs> And then if you actually did get to the right paperwork where you could get your refund, they would catch you in another trap and another trap and another trap. And then they change all the paperwork so you can't actually do it. Like they made it impossible for us to, to settle the matter. I do know people who can, who can settle the matter and have had success doing that on a number of occasions through, uh, let's say, operating through an irrevocable common law trust and just, uh, this is very generally speaking, but attributing everything every financial interaction with any vendor as an expense of the trust and then um, recouping it that way. Yeah. And the problem with it is I've talked to people that have been, been in these groups like 25, 30 years. They have to keep those groups so small because anybody that comes and injects the wrong paperwork, any new influencer gets them all lost in a whole nother loop. Yep. My point is the system is designed for us to fail. Mm -hmm. It's designed to give us some like idea of remedy, but not actual remedy. Mm -hmm. it, it's just corrupt to the core. Yeah. I and then when agree. they siphon all the world's wealth and they have infinity on their books, they can continue to add process and procedure to keep us wound up in the matrix. Mm -hmm. In fact, at one point, Anne LaFleur, uh, my partner, she, I mean, she just blew me away and I felt so bad for her because she spent probably three weeks researching this and she comes and she's like, okay, I got it. You, you first, you have to do this to get your, you know, to get this back out, this back. And it was literally like a 50 step process to become free. Mm -hmm. And I just remember thinking, yeah, no one's going to do all that. And mm -hmm. set, and as soon as like 10% of the, of the slaves start doing that, they're just going to add a whole nother loophole. Mm -hmm. So it's not really the solution, totally. you know, maybe if you want unlimited wealth and yeah, that you want to make that, you know, that your new career, <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's yeah, great. It's like, it's like a partial solution, but it's not the, f I, I totally agree with you. Totally agree. It's yeah. not, it's not how we save the world, I guess no. is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, that's, that's a really good. I don't want to deal in that construct of the chicken coop. <laughs> I get what you mean. <laughs> totally get what you mean. Yeah. That's why I'm a huge proponent of voluntarism. And that's why, again, that's why I talk about both is like, is like, yeah, these processes, but the the philosophy of like, you as a man or woman, I don't I don't care what your title is. You have no authority over me, like none, none. none. That's <laughs> the truth. They actually have none. Zero. That's what people have to kind of. I mean, we we. I'm not gonna lie. Okay, and it would be interesting to go into the bonds for the win story. But back in uh, 2022, when I served my school district, my first notice, we were terrified. I mean, we. I mean. It, it was literally shocking and palpable how thick the veil was. Mm. 
to stand against authority. I mean, um, I had Lee Dundas go in front of me and then I went and then I had another gentleman follow. Um, and they did end up removing the mask mandates because we put them on notice. Now for bonds for the win, it was a slightly different process than we're using under the common law practice against the board of supervisors. But in the, in the bonds for the win process, we were simply, it was a three-step process. Again, super simple. You FOIA request asking for their oath of office and their bond and their liability policy. Hmm. And then the second step was, because we were going after them for the masks at the time. The second step was putting them on notice and the notice basically notified them like, look, here's these state 27 state national international laws you're breaking. You're practicing medicine without a license. You need to stop these mask mandates and resign or else, you know what I mean? We're going to file a claim against you. And I would say this is a claim against the surety bond or a claim against the liability policy. And what's fascinating is some of them, most of them would run out of the building. I mean, they would run out of the building, turn off the lights, call the police, freak out. Do you know what I mean? Like, because they're scared and they're looking for their employer to protect them. Right. Well, because they they're are spiritual. now realizing like, oh, I can't just fall back on my employer to cover me. They're they're saying that I am personally liable as a man or a woman. Exactly. And yeah. then they'd go seek counsel. They'd come back seven days later and vote no more masks, you know, seven zero, the whole board saying, I'm not taking the fall from my employer. They'd vote no more masks and no more porn in the libraries. You know what I mean? Just because we were put in pressure. So again, it's it's a dynamic where you say to the to the corporation, I don't agree anymore. And you and you really do shift it. And I kept telling people it's 90% holy war, 10% paper. Mm -hmm. Because of the 90% of people that did serve, few followed through. But for those that did follow through, the liability companies were contacting these board members saying, Yeah, we don't cover you for criminal liability. You're practicing medicine without a license. What makes you think we're going to cover you for this? Mm -hmm. No, you're bonded to the people, not to your liability policy. That's for like kids falling off the monkey bars. <laughs> yeah, That's not for like parents or I'm sorry, that's not for like teachers raping kids or you guys harming these kids in the classroom. You know what I'm saying? Like that's, that's not how it works. And mm -hmm. so there's a fundamental, I think, mind shift that happens when you put them in check. And again, I think it's the ultimate checkmate move if we did this in mass. Yeah. If we form our groups over here in the promised land and we know fundamentally now who we're dealing with, because that's the biggest thing of offering acceptance. I accept that you're offering these contracts. <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> I voluntarily choose to be free. And then I voluntarily choose to form like-minded individuals who want to walk in agreement with me and form councils of 12. To let you guys know that you should defect over here. But over here, we do need to start creating space and, and, and uh, awareness to a new form of school system, a new form of uh, police, uh, I should say, peace officer assistance, a new form of um, so many things, I mean, agriculture. I mean, there's just so many groups right. that can form. And I noticed you have that, too, on your website, that you guys have actually formed groups. Yeah, well, we're we're here in the next... I don't know when this will air. So I'll just speak plainly. <clears throat> we are uh, an unincorporated, a uh, private based organization, essentially. That's what the way forward is. And we're educating people on a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here. And also a lot of stuff related to health and, and philosophy. And uh, I guess you could say some esoteric stuff within our membership. And we have members all over the world. So yeah, that's what we're doing. I love that. And you know what I'm really trying to push for right now is um, for the last two years, I feel like I've been recruiting some of the most brilliant people, veterans that know to common law to the core. I'm a veteran, no by the way, too. I, I'm West awesome. Point grad, former army captain, so. Nice. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. So I'm trying to formulate what's called, what, what we would call truth talks, similar to TED Talks, where we give them the format. We give them that hour stage. We say, here, show us all in, in an hour or less the problem and the solution as you see it, whether it be in the banking aspect of things, in the uh, private versus public, in the debtor versus creditor mentality, because that's a big one. We've all been turned into debtors. Yep. If we think that we're worth nothing, how are we supposed to build something? Right. Something this big. You know, they want to keep us thinking we are so small. So that debtor creditor is very psychological. We're debting the people who are debting society now. We're stacking up the debt instruments. And that's something Cal Washington is just a genius at. Yeah. I'm so proud to know him and to see what he's doing too. He's and mad. he also has a group uh, forming. And, um, and power movement. 
empower movement. And a lot of people are coming together in communities and he's serving on, I think it was a four basis of like, you know, um, 5D towers, the smart meters, the vaccinations. And one other thing was the chemtrails because that's worldwide. Mm -hmm. And so he's getting through the notices. He's tacking that debt instrument. He's building up the debt, putting leverage back. And again, this is spiritual. It's a yep. spiritual war. We kind of think of money as being energy. It mm-hmm. is energy. And the more you uh, you create new openings, because remember, I believe we in the, under the law of correspondence, and this is a this is not esoteric. This is a law of the universe. It's an un, you know it's, it's like you can't actually argue it. If you if someone gives you a bunch of hate. And you give back hate, what are you going to get more of? Hate. Yeah. Well, if someone gives you hate and you give back love, they don't have to make a choice. And that actually might feel uncomfortable for them. They may choose to walk away and stay in their own social construct in their mind. But the more you put pressure and the more you build that debt instrument, I mean, imagine, imagine now you're working for an employer and you've now got $42 million stacked on you just because you chose this one job. I don't think the jobs is, you know, as valuable to me anymore. Right. Yeah. I think I'd walk away from that job. I think I'd yeah. walk away from that employer. And I'd like the notice so that I can make that, you know, informed consensual choice. But I do feel like because we live in a closed system, we have to create the openings. We have to create that kind, which I think is what you're doing. You're basically trying, you know, to do that. It's like, here's this voluntary option to think different. And that's what we're doing for Operation Restoration is we're bringing all these groups together like you who've already formed communities. And we're saying, look, you guys have this piece. You guys have this piece. Why don't you, you know what I mean? Why don't we all start working together? And or even just sharing educational materials cross project, you know, cross groups, because some of these groups that are forming, they're very spiritual, like your your, your vibe attracts your tribe. That's and definitely so my group. My, my, my group is very esoteric and spiritual. Yeah. That, and that has a, a deeper meaning because it's it's more alchemical, right? You, you're walking in more agreement. So from an alchemical perspective, let's just talk about that because I think this is fascinating. You basically have, you know, you have this beautiful freedom of, of free will here. It's a freedom of choice realm, actually. We we don't realize that we are free already and that there's nothing that can stop your freedom, yep. only you. Yep. So everything starts with a thought, which is um, electrical. And then it goes through this process. I, I put it at the tip of the spear, right? Because the process is free will. you got to give that yes or no. And then the emotion that you have as a result of the thought, as a result of moving forth on the thought, is the... Um, is the, uh, uh, electro, sorry, uh, it's not mechanical. It's, I always want to say mechanical, which is bad. It's, it's magnetic. Yeah. So the emotion is magnetic. So now you've got the thought, emotion, thought, emotion. So it's electromagnetic, electromagnetic. And now you're creating this beautiful thing. And, and even among a group of people, now you have the power of agreement. So now you're tripling, quadrupling, and the universe loves it when you do something positive. It's like the power of a positive thought is 10,000 times more powerful than the power of a negative thought, which means all we got to do is think positive and we already won. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like now that's, you are 1,000% speaking my language. So a uh, really good friend of mine, Eileen McCusick, who I've interviewed a number of times, we do events together. She's the world's leading pioneer in the human biofield, the electromagnetic field that surrounds the human body that's measurable and observable. And per her work, what she always says, um, and she's observed this countless times, a strong coherent field will, will overtake and entrain a weak incoherent field. So the more that we can individually represent strong coherent fields, the more that we create concentric rings of coherent fields around like-minded groups who are doing the same thing. And that sends ripple effects out into the ether that absolutely has a positive impact that overtakes and entrains weak incoherent fields. Absolutely. And we can also create packets around our name to protect ourselves from even our own signature. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when, when we do that, we're operating in the private Mm -hmm. And we serve them in the public, but we're still operating in the private. So they can't even track our name. They only know the public name. So again, there are, there are ways that we can really create almost like not only packets of positive thoughts, right? And this is, this is cool too. I don't know if you've been researching the mirror effect. Some people call it the law of being. Okay. Um, But this one's really great. So when you look in the mirror and you smile at it, what does it have to do? has to smile back it can't not it's a right. it's a law right if you frown at it what does it have to do it has to frown well there may be a delay in the universe 
but it has to smile yeah. back. And I won't even consider frowning. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's not even part of my vocabulary. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like that's really neat knowing because it's fundamentally mathematical yeah. that there may be a delay and you may have to hit a few bumps on the road, but if you keep persevering and you stay focused on that one goal, it will, it will mirror back into yeah. this reality. And if we can do that collectively, then that's just, it's, it'll happen probably I think, faster than we think. Yeah. It, ether air high five for that one. That was, that oh, was yeah, high five. That was good. <laughs> that was great. Okay, cool. Um, I think that that sort of rounds out everything that I want to discuss. Is there anything else that you'd like to share, Mickey? No, I think that right now, I think we just have to be open to a new idea. Mm. And it all starts with an idea. See, that's the beauty of an idea. It's like, that is the right brain thought form coming into speaking, coming into reality. Then, so I'm just saying it increases the power of it when it comes into speech, just us speaking it into the realm and then scribing it into the realm, signing it into the realm, bringing it forth among the law of, you know, agreement into the realm. Then you start putting process and procedure and, you know, and you start to formulate, or I would maybe say, pardon the idea of freedom. That's all we needed. That's all we ever needed was an idea because that's where it sparks. That is that spark. Yeah. And it's not hope. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a remembrance. It's an emotion. It's yeah. Yeah. And it starts here first. It has to start here. Cause if you're coming at these processes, the 10% of paperwork, as you're sharing with fear or rage, and you're not acting in honor, you're just perpetuating more hate more division, then you're not only not going to have success, but you're just going to perpetuate more of the same paradigm that we're trying to alchemize into something new, let's say. 100%. And then the the other big one is to be so beyond scribing and signing is investing in. So investment can be in so many forms. It could be just in love. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And, and the higher the frequency of the investment you're doing emotionally also has that esoteric power, right? So pure enlightenment, and pure acceptance would be even higher. Do you know what I mean? Um, a higher frequency or vibration that would draw this in. And so I'm right. I'm all about building a new. And when I say operational restoration, I mean let's let's restore our thought process first. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the forefathers did. They said, okay, we want no more of that. And they migrated over and they said, we declare now our, our independence. We declare and decree where we're going from this day forth. I now am the master of my ship. I've given leadership to God. I want him to be my guide, or I want the universe to be my guide, or I want my higher self to be my guide, or I want the quantum field to be my, whatever people say, whatever resonates with you, people do need to become aware of that. So that's one last thing I want to drop. I know it's been a long interview, but I think this would be like about a one minute. Honestly, you're, you have plenty of time. Usually my interviews are like an hour and a half to two hours. So you're good. Okay, great. It's fine. What I did when I set off to freedom, and this was about a year ago, and this is my own personal self-governance journey. When I became aware that there was this sort of angel on the shoulder and the devil on the other that's constantly influencing my thoughts and that, you know, it really maybe is a little bit more gray. There are some things that, you know, oh, I, I realize that there's negative influence and positive influence. I created a, a trust in my in my mind. And in my mind, I said, okay, I'm going to create a spiritual trust wherein I visualize maybe even a triangle above me. And that trust is a triangle simply because there's three parties to every trust. You've got the executor or the grantor. Um, you've got the uh, the trustee. So in this case, the grantor for me is God, but it could be whatever anyone wants. The all, some would say, or the universe, or someone say my higher self. And anyone that you set as your grantor actually does set your, your experience in life because everything is based on those choices and those thoughts and emotions. So... Then I set myself up as the trustee because I know I'm here to, to operate in this form in this lifetime. And I set up the beneficiaries as anyone who comes in into benefit of my works here on this in this lifetime. And then I place my mind, my sorry, my body, mind, and spirit into that trust. I just in my mind, I place it in there. And I place my children in there as well. These are my dependents until 18. And I said, from this day forward, I operate in the private, meaning I only want to be affected or influenced by those in the highest and greatest order, meaning the highest and greatest for me, my life path, and anyone around me. And I hereby from this day forth want to operate in the private. I don't want any negative thoughts, feelings, wills, or emotions to enter into my spiritual trust because I know now I can claim authority. Mm. 
that I can claim my own spiritual authority. And that sets, because all things happen in the spirit realm first with a thought yeah. that set me in a completely different direction on my journey. And so I recommend people do that as a preliminary step to declare and decree and become mindful and aware of who your grantor is. Yeah. And in this process, what you're doing is just a perfect example of reclaiming our co-creative capacity for this experience, because whether we're aware of it or not, I hate even saying, quote, they, but they are acutely aware of it, which is why they try to get us in this perpetual state of fear or a perpetual state of rage or a perpetual state of both, where we're focusing on whatever agendas they've got going on. And then we're actually helping to feel that with our co-creative capacity. So now it's yeah. like, I'm aware of all the nonsense that they're doing. I don't really give two shits. I'm aware, fully aware of it. I'm not spiritual bypassing. I'm not pretending it's not happening, but I'm aware. But now I'm going to align my thoughts and feelings and take deliberate action to create the the experience that I want for myself, my community, my family. Exactly. So let's bring it all the way back. So left brain over here, we're, we're dealing in a fight, flight, freeze mode because they keep us in a constant state of argument. Whereas over here, we're in this surrender creative mode, yeah. co-creation, co-creative, not see the co-creation and creative. Wow. I mean, nothing can stop us because... Yeah you know, in, in, except for money at this point. And so that's why we do have to create that dynamic shift between debting the debtors instead of, and, and, and no longer allowing for us to remain in debt. So mm -hmm. I think the way you dismantle that is you stop paying into their system. You stop investing over here and you start investing over here, you know, and you, you do the minimal, <laughs> but let's be very clear. I want to be very clear. Do not stop paying your mortgage. Do not stop playing inside that matrix. Think of yourself as Neo when you pop in and out of there, right? Yeah, you might get you might get pulled over. You you might have to keep paying your mortgage for a while. You might have to keep paying your car registration and, and stay incognito, stay somewhat, you know, let's just not let's not be in contention with what it is. Mm -hmm. Let's just observe it for what it is and start to invest over here. But you have to become aware of what you're investing in. If we're investing in this, we're going to get more of that. We're investing in this, we're going to get more of that, right. right? So that's something I think most people are not actually aware. They'd rather go into a state of resistance, which is just energy wasted, mm -hmm. uh, versus a state of, yeah, co-creation. Let's, let's forge this new world together. And let's actually, for a minute, shelf them. We already know who they are. And we, they, we know they're going to rubber stamp everything anyway, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's why I'm like the, the co-creation, the creation side of it, um, I think because it has such, such validity and, and what we want, we all know what we want, then we can manifest it, mm. you know? Yeah. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. Awesome. Well, um, Thank you. if you're interested in uh, learning more about Mickey, all the links will be in the show notes. And um, this has been an awesome conversation. Mickey, thank you for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's a sincere pleasure.